What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the LA Soccer Hub Show. My name is Gio Garcia, and today we got a very special episode. I uh, apologize if the audio is not as clear as if you guys have been used to. I'm currently also on an interna- international break, uh, you know, Mexico City. So if you guys hear any sounds, you know, noise, you hear any, you know, traffic or anything like that, just part of the experience of this podcast. Uh, and today's special guest, um, you've definitely heard of him if you uh, heard of American soccer or anything like that. And he goes by Grant Walk. Grant, how are you doing? I'm good, Gio. How are you? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Enjoying enjoying a couple games, you know, while we're in the national international break, you know, having a break myself. But what about you? I know you've been traveling around. Yeah, it's been a, a really busy, productive time, fun time, uh, work wise. You know, there's a lot of a lot of soccer going on, so I'm doing different things. Uh, I have a writing site, uh, grantwall.com. So I, uh, whenever the U.S. men's and women's national teams have a big game, I go on site and cover those games, write a magazine-style story off them. And uh, so I was in Cincinnati for the U.S.'s win against Morocco. And then we're recording this on Friday, so I, I go this weekend to Kansas City uh, for the U.S. game against Uruguay, and uh, you know, I've also been traveling around for a documentary film project I'm working on uh, on the U.S. Mexico soccer riv- rivalry, and um, that's set to come out in November. And it's been a lot of fun just going around interviewing different figures in the rivalry, and you know, we're doing the the storytelling fifty fifty on from both sides, so it's equal parts mexico and u.s that's awesome that, that has to be exciting because i know that that is that that rivalry is, is insane i was just i was just at the i was back here in march for the game here which is the game's always amazing so tell me tell me a little bit more about that like why why do you want to do that and how long is, is a documentary you know it's something that is one of the big stories defining stories i think of soccer in this part of the world i I would argue that u.s mexico is one of the world's great sports rivalries and there's so much involved in it from the sporting side and the soccer games and the history from over the years to sort of the off the field stuff about the fan bases and identity and how you know the most popular soccer team in the United States is the Mexican national team. You know, mm-hmm. oh, and, and all the <laughs> things that that entails. So uh, it's a it's a really rich story, and I'm looking forward to it coming out. Uh, it's a big team of people working on the project, so I'm hardly the only one. But um, it's going to be about I think three hours, three hour long episodes, and it's set to come out in November ahead of the World Cup. Wow, that, that's that's like that's like perfect timing. Uh, where's this, where's this going to be on Netflix? Where where can people potentially uh, be able to watch it? So hopefully we'll be able to announce publicly soon. Um, okay. We we can't we can't yet, and I would love you to tell you, but you it's going to be. News? You want to break any news? Right here? <laughs> I wish, but I would get in trouble. But it's it's something I'm really excited about, and it's going to be something that a lot of people are going to be able to see. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Hey guys, you guys, I tried, I tried to get Grant, <laughs> Grant Water a break. Um, but let, let's go back a little bit, Grant, because um, I, I want to know a little bit about your story. Like, why, why did you, why did you become a, you know, a soccer journalist? Why? Because obviously, we know you were, you're a sports illustrator for a while. Obviously, I know you also wrote a book. Uh, I believe it's called The Beckham Experience. But tell me from the beginning, how did you start becoming a soccer journalist? You know, I was always into the sport, but I didn't think maybe when I was growing up that I would be a soccer journalist. You know, I decided pretty early on, even when I was in high school, that I wanted to write for Sports Illustrated because I had gotten the magazine uh, as a Christmas present, I think when I was probably nine years old and read it every week. You know, my parents would get it for me every year. And I knew by then that I wasn't going to be a professional athlete myself and so um i liked the idea of being a writer you know and and writing magazine stories and traveling around and covering sports i just thought it would probably be in other sports you know And, and the fact is is that i did do um you know college basketball is my main sport for several years at sports illustrated and i did soccer on the side because there just wasn't enough demand from the editors for a full-time soccer writer. 
in those days. But what I found was that I really enjoyed the soccer stories, even more than the basketball stories. I really liked the variety of stories in soccer um, compared to other sports. I liked the people in it. I liked the telling the story of the growth of soccer in the United States and the national teams. And so after a while, I, I started saying to my bosses at Sports Illustrated, I wish I could go full-time soccer. And uh, finally in 2009, that happened. Uh, ESPN tried to hire me away from Sports Illustrated, and, and SI asked me, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to cover soccer full-time. And so that's when I moved to full-time soccer. And, you know, I, I never played soccer at a high level. I, I played until I was 13 or 14. And, um, and like so many kids in the eighties and early nineties quit and, you know, did other sports in, um, in high school, like basketball and, um, cross country track and field. But, I still liked watching soccer. I liked the sport. And so for me, uh, indoor soccer was actually pretty big in the eighties. And we had a team in Kansas city where I grew up. And so we went to games a lot, really enjoyed it. And the first sort of outdoor soccer I remember watching much was the 1990 world cup that the U S had gotten to first time in 40 years for the U S men. And, um, I watched about every game of the 90 world cup. And so was really into the sport at that point. And then in college at Princeton covered the soccer team, Bob Bradley's Princeton team for the school newspaper. Uh, Jesse Marsh played on that team. You know, now he's the Leeds United coach and, you know, really got into covering it, writing it about it. And I did my senior thesis in college on politics and soccer in Argentina and oh, lived wow. in Buenos Aires for three months, had a great experience. And so by the time I started, my journalism career was sort of known as a soccer guy, but, you know, still needed to um, find somebody that would be interested in having me do it full time. And thankfully was in the end. Yeah. Well, I think that's, a, that's amazing. Cause if you were like, you know, you just mentioned you were just in Buenos Aires and Argentina, it doesn't, I mean, Boca Juniors were played. It doesn't get any bigger than that. In my opinion. I mean, you got places in Brazil and stuff like that, but once you're able to experience that, I just, I just feel like anything else, you know, you, 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 you got the knowledge, you know, if, if you're down there covering, covering soccer and all that, but cause I feel like for me, like it, it's kind of stomach. Cause I used to cover basketball and all these different sports, but it, it's, it's like, um, it's like an underserved sport, like where I feel like a lot of people can grow if, you know, you put the content out there, you write obviously like a podcast like this, because it's obviously you've seen it a lot longer than I have, but like the last four years, just me covering the MLS, I've seen the growth, I've seen the demand and how exciting it is. I obviously like, I know people, they people, you know, talk some smack about the MLS, but like, I'm very passionate about the MLS because just the competition and growth and just seeing, uh, how some of the European players kind of struggled sometimes to adapt, even so, some of the South Americans. Uh, let me ask you about that. What, what what are your thoughts so far on the MLS and the growth that we've seen in America? I became a professional journalist in 1996, so that was the year MLS started. So I've had a chance to see at every stage of MLS's growth where it's been. And, you know, there are some good MLS teams in the nineties, you know, those DC United teams, the LA galaxy teams. So the soccer itself has, um, you know, there've been good teams all along the way. It's gotten better, obviously, as the salary spend has gotten bigger, uh, in the league. But, um, you know, I, I'm impressed with the growth, uh, of the league, you know, and, and, to have 28 teams this season, you know, there were as few as 10 teams at one point mm -hmm. in the league and real questions about whether it was going to survive in the early 2000s. And it went from teams being valued at like $5 million, $10 million expansion fees, and now an expansion fee is like $350 million. Yeah, which is crazy. And so clearly the economic side is, is looking promising um, and the league has done a really good job in the individual cities of, of building stadiums and getting people to come to the game. So attendance is good. 
the one area they still need to figure out, which is really important, is national television because the ratings still aren't that big. It, I feel like MLS is um, more of a local sport than a national league um, at this point. And so there's, they, they got to figure out the TV side, but um, you know, MLS is sort of envied, I think, by the owners in other countries of soccer teams in, in Mexico, in England, around Europe, because um, it's a economically sustainable model. And I don't know if European soccer is an economically sustainable model. And that's important. Now, where MLS needs to get better is the soccer quality, the players who come, the, the amount of money being spent on players. I want to see all that improve, but I do think it was a nice step forward to win for an MLS team to win the CONCACAF Champions League yeah. like Seattle did recently. And, you know, finally now there's some real momentum in that area and some questioning of, you know, is, is MLS going to pass Liga MX at some point? They haven't yet, but, you know, they need to get MLS teams winning CONCACAF Champions League on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. But the gap is closing. Yeah, let me let me ask you a little bit more about that because you, you talked about the packaging deal, and and I, and I would agree with that because it's it definitely does depending where you where you're on the country, it is definitely more local. But also, I feel like um, you know me just just coming in four years, I think the the difficult thing about the MLS, just as someone that's been covering and been been on the beat, you know, obviously covering both teams in LA, is like the DPs, the the, the terminologies, right? Tam, Gam, and all these different things. I think that is kind of like right as americans it's like we're used to the nba the salary cap and all these all these different things i understand europe is different it's open or whatever but i don't know i just feel like and i've talked to other people but i just feel like the dps like and the tams and the restricting of that uh, i i get that it, it, it was good to start the league that way but i just want to know your thoughts do you think they should open it up a little bit more like in europe or what are, what are your thoughts on that well if you talk to a lot of chief soccer officers around MLS, they most of them will tell you they wish the salary rules were simplified, that it wasn't so complicated in terms of TAM and, and specific buckets that you have to spend from for players. And they just wish there was like a it, salary cap, okay, but tell me how much money I have to spend and I can spend it on players within that very simple requirement. And I do think there's some value to that, that discussion. And then teams can pick different strategies of how they want to spend that money. Do they want to get a, you know, a big star from Europe? Do they want to more evenly spread out that money over the entirety of the roster? Because it's possible that if you do that, your team's actually going to be better. Um, so I wish the league would do that, and I don't see any reason why they they shouldn't. I don't necessarily think MLS wants to be like Europe, in, because it, Europe is very much the Wild West, and I don't think it's a, a sustainable model. And there's a real inequality between teams in Europe. And far too much in Europe, you know at the beginning of the season who's going to win a domestic league title. You know, how many has Bayern won? Bayern Munich won 10 straight now, I think, in <laughs> Germany. And, and yeah. you know, that's to me, that's a problem. Um, and so you don't want to create a situation like that. So I, I actually, I, I don't mind the idea of, of salary caps as long as that number's high. Mm -hmm. And I guess, in, in you know, you wish that it would be sort of equalized everywhere. That's a little pie in the sky. I don't think that's entirely likely, but I'd obviously like to see more stars and top players in their prime in MLS than we currently do. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think, I think I don't mind the salary cap because I think in America we're kind of used to that with the NBA and the football and it's easy to understand. I think just the terminology, even when I try to explain it to my friends, they just, it's like, it just it just goes over there, you know. It's like, and then it's like I don't want to like, cause they're like, who like you know, cause in LA obviously you got Carlos Vela and Chicharito, but they're like, why can't they get this guy? I'm like, oh, cause they already used three DPs. And they're like, what's the I'm like, I was like, you know, <laughs> it's this whole discussion, you know. what I'm saying so. I just feel like, to me, that's why when I started learning all those different things, and I was like, 
if I'm even having trouble understanding right. it, then like the at the local, like you know, I understand like the MLS has done a great job, but I feel like you know, just trying to get that local fan that it's like you know, like you know, just like oh, I want to get more committed, and then I just I just feel it's difficult. But yeah, I hope they open it up to sixty p, seventy p's, or whatever, like like that within the salary cap, you know, because I think it's exciting, you know, having all European stars, South American stars, because you know, like you just met, you mentioned earlier, you know, Seattle just won the Coca Cola Champions League, you know, and if you you have have that consistency, you know, the league is just going to grow, and you're going to get bigger, bigger names. Uh, talking about that, obviously there was like so some rumors or whatever of like. Met who just won the, the finalissima against Italy, uh, which was amazing. What are your thoughts on Messi potentially coming to the MLS? Because I know there's, there's a lot of smoke there, but obviously he's obviously the you know the biggest superstar in the world or one of the biggest superstars. Um, but what are your what are your thoughts? Would you like to see that happen? I'd love to see it happen, and I think there's a decent chance at least of it happening at some point. I, you know, I could see Messi in Miami. Um, I don't think it's a hundred percent. So he might have other options, other desires. Um, but I could see it happening. I, I don't know if the report that came out recently that got so much attention is actually, I had some questions about it just because they said that Messi was being offered a 35% stake in ownership stake in the club into Miami. And that seems a little high for me. Um, you know, MLS clubs, in some cases, in the cases now have been valued as much as like eight hundred million dollars, and so I, I don't know if that's something that Inter Miami would be willing to give up for any player, including Messi. But however, they would end up getting him. I think it would be great. Um, you know, it's interesting. I interviewed Messi in twenty sixteen for a story for Sports Illustrated before the Copa America Centenario that he was playing in here in the U.S. And um, we had a sort of a microphone malfunction at the start because we were doing video of it. And so we had about five minutes just to talk, you know, with nothing being recorded. And he had questions for me, which I thought was interesting about soccer in the United States and in the city I'm from, Kansas City. And so I told him about Sporting Kansas City and the stadium they had built and how soccer has become a cool thing to do on a Saturday night in Kansas City. And they, they fill that stadium usually. And um, I just thought it was interesting that he was curious about that. He had questions about that. So he seems to have some level of interest in what's happening in MLS. And I'm curious to see if that becomes even more serious as time goes on and, and might result in him coming here. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'd, I'd definitely be excited. I mean, you may, you definitely make room for him. I think he opened up the fourth DP automatically, you know, if he decides, <laughs> right? If he just decides tomorrow, whenever uh, he does uh, do that. Uh, just finishing up with MLS, obviously, I, I saw you at the U.S. Open Cup, uh, you know, LAFC, LA Galaxy. Talk to me about that rivalry because, obviously, uh, you're outside looking in, but you're at that game. What are, what are your thoughts on uh, the LAFC, El Trafico, what it's called, the LA Derby? What are your thoughts on that rivalry? I enjoy it. I think it's, you know, even though it's young, it's one of the best rivalries in MLS, and I think those have been real games over the years. I guess I'm a little surprised that LA Galaxy – seems to have the upper hand in numbers of wins. You know, LAFC's maybe won some of the more important individual knockout games, but um, LAFC has really struggled playing in the stadium of the Galaxy. And that continued the night we saw each other and LAFC went out of the Open Cup. So, but you can tell it's a real rivalry and there's real dislike between the teams. You know, it was a little crazy there at the end oh, yeah. when teams came together but um you want that in a rivalry you kind of need that and mls needs more of an edge yeah. to it i think in terms of rivalries in terms of um players speaking out i i yeah. i if having i think the league needs more villains you know ibrahimovic actually did a pretty good job of that i thought when was he was amazing. in the league so um it's personality and it's a good thing to have in your league not a bad thing and so hopefully we'll get more rivalries in the league like that. There's a few. I mean, like Portland, Seattle is a fantastic rivalry. And actually San Jose Galaxy is a really good rivalry. 
Yeah, I think you just hit on a great, a great point because that's that's what I've been talking about. I, I think Raheem Edwards, like you know, he 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 was pretty vocal, and then LAFC fans were pretty upset. But he even said it like uh, I don't know if you saw his post game comments, but he even said it. He's like, you know, I think the league is a little too soft. We need certain things like that. And I, I would I would agree, you know, because I I just that's how like the NBA football and all, you know, you get these sound bites. Um, but if it's authentic, right, you know, it's like, like you're like, you know, I had the opportunity when I first started, started, started covering slot time and he was just uh, an amazing superstar because he knew how to use the media. And he was also one to back it up. He would say, yeah, like I'm the better player, quote unquote, uh, in MLS or whatever. And then he show up against, you know, LAFC. So you could be like, all right, he also backs it up. You know what I'm saying? So, I would agree, and I think that's – the league definitely used a lot more of those personalities, um, which which is pretty impressive. So, yeah, I like it. I, I think the, the rivalry is really good. Um, let, let's talk about, uh, obviously, you know, international break. Um, what what are your thoughts on for the for the U.S. men's national team, right? Because, you know, they got they got Uruguay. Who did they just beat Mexico yesterday, 3-0? But what, what are your thoughts on that? Let's go with the uh, U.S. men's national team, and then we'll talk about the Mexican national team um, leading up to the World Cup. Yeah, I mean – First off, it's good for the U.S. to be in the World Cup to have qualified because it's not guaranteed, as fans know now after the last cycle. But, um, you know, I, I, I think the U.S. has reason to feel like things are promising in terms of what's happening um, in, in qualifying for this World Cup and the potential to get out of the group. Um, you know, it's... Uh, a group that obviously has England in it and they're a contender to win the tournament, but I think the U S will be motivated for that game. And, you know, then Iran, which is a decent team, but a team that the U S can get a result against, I think. And then we don't know quite yet. Is it going to be Ukraine or Wales? And that's going to be the opening game. So, you know, if you're Greg Berhalter, you're hoping that you don't have too many injuries to deal with and, there's not a lot of preparation time for the World Cup. You know, you've got these three games in June against Uruguay and then uh, the Nations League games against Grenada and El Salvador, which are what they are. And then you've only got two friendlies in September, and that's it before the World Cup. There won't even be any time for the for the team to have friendlies right before the World Cup. So um, I think it's just... Uh, uh, I would say this about this U.S. team, that they seem to be very together in a way that wasn't always the case five years ago. And I think it, it helps a lot when the players are on the same page, they like each other, they like coming into national team camp, and they're young. And I think they've gotten more experience through qualifying in CONCACAF and we'll now see how they do against better teams from Europe and South America and uh, see what they bring to the table. I, I think the experience in champions league that these young U S players have is going to help at the world cup. I don't think they're going to be overawed by the occasion. So I think all of that's good. I think it's good to have a young team at the world cup too, because you know, it's a very, athletic game at this point and the older your team is i think the more you're going to struggle and I, I think mexico might have a real challenge because their their squad is older and experience helps only to a certain extent and, and the, a lot of the surprising bad performances we see from teams at the world cup is because the roster is too old yeah no i would, I would agree um I, I gotta ask you about uh you know Chris talked about i guess the lack of support you know i don't have his word for word for word but i'm assuming you saw the clip of you know i don't know if it was necessarily on the fans maybe might have been you know to the u.s men's national team you know the, the federation um but what are, what are your thoughts on christian Pulisic? he had to say obviously he's the leader of the team but um you know he's it seemed like he wants more more support whether it's the federation or the fans um what were your thoughts on what he had to say yeah, I mean, it's a little vague because he didn't really talk for very long about it, and so it left questions about who is he addressing with what he was saying, what does he really want. And I think the most likely scenario, and I admit this is speculation, is a pretty basic one, 
you know, I don't think, I think some people are overcomplicating this. I think Christian Pulisic is a player who wishes there was more support for the U.S. team in that stadium that night in Cincinnati. So I don't think it's much more than that. I don't think he was like necessarily, I don't think he was calling out U.S. soccer. I guess it's possible, but I think it's a, you know, players are generally pretty uncomplicated. And I think he was just saying something based on that stadium and that situation. And the big part of it was that there were a lot of people cheering for Morocco, who wearing Morocco gear in the stadium that night. And this is not a new development in the United States, right? I mean, this goes back decades when you've had because of immigration patterns, because people have come from all over the world to the United States to make a new life for themselves. And a part of their identity that they retain is their soccer fandom for the national team from back home. And I actually view this as a positive about the United States of America as a country, that this is what we're built on. Immigrants coming to this country over centuries, and making a new life for themselves. And so I don't view that as a bad thing. I view it as a wonderful thing and something that Americans should be proud of. And in soccer, it happens to manifest itself with fans in U.S. stadiums playing against the United States. And sometimes the U.S. It has fewer people openly cheering for them than for the other team, whether it's Mexico or Morocco or whomever. And I understand it's it I understand the frustration of a US player. Polisic's certainly not the only one to experience this. This goes back to the 80s and 90s. And what I would say about that that stadium the other night against Morocco is those Moroccan fans were not hostile. Mm -hmm. So when I say Moroccan fans, Moroccan American fans fans of Morocco who are probably almost all American, by the way. And, but they, it, it was a festive atmosphere. And a lot of those fans, like when the anthems happened, were very positive about the Morocco anthem, were very positive about the U.S. anthem. So it wasn't even a hostile situation like the U.S. team has faced on occasion playing Mexico in the U.S. when like projectiles have been thrown by some people in the stands at the U.S. team. Yeah. Um, if, if I could ask you, because um, this is what I, I see online is like, it's the U.S. plays in the Midwest. That's why the ticket sales are too high. I'm assuming maybe that's a factor. Maybe it's not. But obviously, you've been all over the country. Where it does does location matter for the U.S.? And if you obviously you you know soccer better than anyone, where should 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 the U.S. men's national team play their quote unquote home games? I mean, ideally, I would like to see the location of U.S. national team games have more variation and go to more cities. Um, and so I think it's a little crazy that that was my fourth trip to Ohio for a U.S. men's national team game in the last eight months. You know, two qualifiers in Columbus, one qualifier in Cincinnati, and now this friendly in Cincinnati. So that's a lot of games in Ohio. And the reason that this game took place in Cincinnati again was mainly because Greg Berhalter, the U.S. coach, wanted to focus and prioritize the training conditions every day and is very comfortable. He really likes the Cincinnati training setup. And they had quite a few days with the team. And he wanted to prioritize that. He wasn't really thinking as much about the Cincinnati stadium situation for the game. It was more about training and preparation. Even then though, I think U S soccer needs to do a, a better job of spreading out games around the country. And I do think fans have legitimate complaints about high prices for tickets. And so just because you feel like you can charge a certain amount of money doesn't mean you should for all the tickets. And if you're not selling out stadiums, I think you should have a way to, to get those tickets in the hands of potential new fans, you know, 
uh, even charities or whatever, like get kids excited about going to become a, a U.S. soccer fan and seeing those games. Um, it's a the whole topic is is complicated and it and there's a lot to it. But I understand the frustration of fans in cities on the West Coast or in other parts of the U.S. that haven't had the U.S. team come there for a while. And they're seeing how many games are in Ohio. Now, this was a friendly. So there was no attempt by U.S. soccer to um, distribute tickets ahead of time to certain fan, you know, fan bases to try and artificially create a pro U S atmosphere at the game. Mm. Yeah. You know, which we had seen in Cincinnati for the U S Mexico game last November to try and create as much as possible, a pro USA crowd. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if Polisic was referring to that and how it was different from the last game they had in Cincinnati against Mexico. And obviously world cup qualifiers are different from friendlies. Yeah. But Number yeah, it's, an, it's a complicated topic, but it's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, I know we got a little bit more time, but um, let me ask you this. Obviously, we've seen players like Carlos Vela, Chicharito. Um, you know, essentially, Chicharito has revived, quote, unquote, his, his career. You you saw him and how, how he looked. What, what are your thoughts about, you know, players that have come, gone, gone to Europe but come to the MLS and still be able to be, quote, unquote, called up or have that level of, of, of soccer, an elite level, uh, what are your thoughts, like you know, like Chicharito? And obviously, we know Carlos Vela has has declined uh, playing for the for the national team. But what are you? What are your thoughts on players still being able to keep their level within the MLS? You know, I think it's possible for players to to come back to or come to MLS from maybe Europe and still play at a high enough level to have an impact at World Cups and with their national teams. You know, uh, you know, Landon Donovan had a few loans in Europe, but mostly played his entire career in MLS. And I don't think that prevented him from having a good world cup in 2010, for example, or, or even 2002. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, but, um, I, I, I feel like Chicharito could help the Mexican national team right now and just isn't being called in, but I think he's played well for the galaxy. No, fair enough. Uh, talk to us about your book, the the the, the Beckham. What was it the Beckham experiment? How, uh, how was that, and where can people buy that? So that was my first book. It came out in two thousand nine. I had spent the two thousand seven and oh eight seasons with the Galaxy after Beckham's arrival, and best uh, reporting experience I've ever had. It was really intense. You know, I was following the team. Uh, Beckham's arrival was a giant cultural event that summer in 07 and impacted so many people. And I wanted to see how the galaxy would do, what sort of impact Beckham ha would have on the other players, how he would respond to stuff. And I got more deeply inside a team than I've ever gotten before. And so that type of experience was really good for me. And then, and then the book I'm really proud of, I'm like more proud of that than any other thing I've done in my career. Um, and you know, it's still available on on Amazon and other places, uh, probably in the paperback version. But um, you know, it it is a good snapshot, I think, of what MLS looked like at a certain time, um, and that's slightly different from today. Players make a little more money today, but it's also a very human story about you know Beckham um, having um, you know just. A, a very fascinating impact on things um, that he was making $50 million at the time. And he had teammates who were making $17,000 a year. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, what happens in that locker room? What happens when they go out for a team meal together? You know, does Beckham pick up the check? Does that not happen? And so there were scenes like that, that I learned about reported and um, yeah, I think make for an interesting book from a, a human perspective. His relationship with Landon Donovan was really fascinating. And Landon let me in a lot in, into his thoughts for the book. So, yeah, I feel you know, really good about the way the book turned out and uh, glad I did it.
Yeah. Well, guys, definitely check out the book. Get, get your hands on the book. Uh, Grant, I want to appreciate you, you know, for hopping on, you know, on the podcast, you know, doing the time. And I know a lot of our listeners are really going to enjoy this uh, combo because it's going to it's gonna be great, you know, and I think if people wanted to hear, especially from you, what's going on currently, you know, in the, in the, in the world of soccer. Um, but yeah, what, what's next for you? I know you said that you have the documentary. Uh, any final words for you? What, what's next? What are you looking forward to? I mean, my big thing these days is my writing site, grantwall.com. So it's uh, a subscription site that um, I put everything I've had into it, and we just passed 2,000 paid subscribers, so I appreciate all the support coming from out there. And it's magazine-style stories. It's two interviews a week. It's a Friday column every week, breaking news, opinions, all the things that I've done over the years – just on one site. And so uh, I'm still doing my twice weekly podcast, Football with Grant Wall, uh, with Chris Whittingham, and doing a lot of a lot of stuff. So um, really enjoying all of it and will continue doing it and in love owning my own stuff, you know, like I own all my content on my podcast, on my writing site, and uh, doing television with CBS as well. So it's uh, it's a lot, but it's it's fun and uh, I can't tell you how much I enjoy covering the sport. Yeah, and it's amazing when you when you do it for yourself too. But um, guy, yeah, guys, definitely check out Grant's a book. Definitely check out GrantWall.com if you haven't already. Grant, I want to thank you so much for being on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's good talking to you. Of course. Hi, everybody.